Hi everybody, my name is Void Clown and I'm so happy and so stoked to be here again. I am doing this iceberg series and I published a video two weeks ago and it got more than a thousand views. So my whole channel has more than a thousand views. I am so grateful and so happy. I couldn't sleep one day and my girlfriend also couldn't sleep. She was already in the living room and so I just, you know, rolled around and then I was like, oh, just let's just get out the phone and look out everything that ever happened in full brightness and also everything that ever will happen, including all the horrible things. There were like 10 notifications about subscriptions and my views were just skyrocketing and it kept like that for a couple of hours. And since then, so many of you have subscribed, commented, contacted me. I'm really hyped. It feels to me like that what I'm doing is giving value and helps and entertains the people who watch it. And that is all that I want to do. To do something that is deep and interesting and that furthers community and that furthers education and that is entertaining and, you know, keeps the horrors at bay by talking about other horrors. Yes. So just the biggest thank you to everybody who subscribed and who watches my videos. I'm not going to stop. And just a big thank you to everybody who watches, who comments, who subscribes who just shows me and communicates with me that what I'm doing is what they like or what they would more to hear from. I'm just super hyped. I really had an issue of going back to sleep that day because I was just sitting on the couch. My girlfriend was next to me and was like, this is amazing. All th there's, there's people who like my stuff. I was so happy. I still am. It's amazing. Ah, oh, it's so nice. And so, yeah, I am. Um, this is the second part of the video. Again, some announcements. First of all, I know that I've been blessed by the Eldritch God Algunor Idum, and I'm gonna try to do the things that the algorithm wants, but I also gotta try to do the things that I wanna do. That's always how you have to do it. You have to do what you believe in and do it the way you want to do it. And then in the borders of that, you can align it with what other people want or how the algorithm wants it. So we're going to continue with the iceberg. We're still going to do other videos. Yes, I'm still so happy. So first of all, here you have the whole iceberg. That was a bit of a feedback. What we're doing here is we're, every video is one layer of the iceberg and we're going to talk about all the words and all the topics in that layer. So this is the layer of today's video. It's the second layer of the iceberg. And then another thing is we've been getting the Oscar nominations. There's, I think, none or almost no nothing horror that is represented in there. Nothing that is dark in the sense of fantasy or in the sense that things are done, not the things that are shown, because, of course, there's some movies about some horrible stuff, but no horror. Um, I'm, a bit, I'm not sad about this because I don't think there was a big Oscar snub in the last year from the horror genre that they have to nominate. I don't know what to do about the whole Barbie nomination thing because Oppenheimer got all the nominations and was a good movie but Barbie got like half of the nominations it deserves and the only big one is okay that's it's movie of the year or the, the, the best movie pi best picture that they got but then Ryan Gosling being nominated which he should be of course but then you know Miss Robbie and Miss Gervick not being nominated kind of sucks. Um, I get the critique that, oh, just because you make a feminist movie or just because you make a movie that takes a shit on man, you shouldn't have an Oscar. But that's not what this is. So this was a big movie. It was the most successful movie of the year. Um, it wouldn't be without Greta or Margot and... Wait, Sophia ver Wait, Sophia also got a Sophia Sophia also got a
Okay, okay. We got some Oscar stuff. Nothing horror-wise was nominated. Not that I know of or nothing big. But there wasn't any snubs this year. When it comes to that, I think there wasn't anything that I saw in the movies that was horror-wise where I was like, that has to be an Oscar. Um, but we're going to get something next year, I think. And then there's the whole Barbie situation. And people are rightfully pissed that Margot Robbie and Greta Gerwig aren't being nominated for Best Director and Best Actresses. Um, and they're like, it's just Ryan Gosling. But I think it's a bit unfair that everybody's talking about, oh, just Ryan Gosling is being nominated because it's still getting Best Picture of the Year. And America Ferrera is also nominated as Best Support Actress. Still, it's a bit ironic that the movie that is about women, then the men or... Ken is getting nominated. But please don't um, skip America Ferrero. She did amazing in this movie. We would all want a nomination for Greta and Margot. I get the critique that just because something is feministic and woke and takes a big dump on men, um, which it didn't, but that's a critique. Oh, you make a... You make a mean movie about men and then you should have nominated Han. Now you didn't, huh? That's what you get. But that's not what's happening here. It's that the movie's about women being heard and then the women are not being heard. <laughs> and it kind of makes you think, huh? That maybe the movie was on about something, wasn't it? And now to the big news, True Detective is back. True Detective season four is back. Season one was amazing. It's... When people ask me what's your favorite series, it's always first season of True Detective. Nothing has surpassed it, not even closely. Um, it's so good, it's so strong, and it has this touch of eldritch horror and cosmic horror, and it is very representative of Call of Cthulhu game in the sense of all the research and detective and conspiracies and cults. Everything is in there. It's so good, the first season. And then the second season... We're not talking about the second season. By the way, it's anthology, so every season is its own thing, like American Horror Story, but they do not have returning casts or anything. And then the third season was quite good, but now the fourth season is on, and I just watched the first episode of the fourth season, and it's so good. It's just really good. Watch it. The first season checks all the boxes for me. I am not going to spoil anything for you. I might do my own video about the whole series the whole fourth season but if you like that kind of stark stuff dark mystery maybe cosmic horror then watch the first season and watch the thing that's coming out right now it's hbo and i'm pretty sure you'll find a way to watch it because they make sure you have a way to watch it and maybe we also make sure we have a way to watch it so let's start with the iceberg let's go jeffrey coombs jeffrey combs jeffrey Combies. He's an American actor and he's very famous for uh, playing in Lovecraftian movies, a bit like Sam Neill. So he played in many adaptions of Lovecraft books or he played in films that were very Lovecraftian inspired. So Herbert West, Reanimator, the story by Lovecraft was then made into Reanimator. There's like three parts and he's in all of them. So for example, the Dunwich Horror from 2008 is also in there. And he's portrayed even Lovecraft himself in some of the films. So he's just an actor that if you're into Lovecraft and you try to find all these pieces of media that are Lovecraftian because they're so rare, then you're going to stumble upon him, just like Sam Neill, for example. And some of these films are very good and some of them are not very good. And it's for you to decide what you like. You'll see his face a lot when you start watching these movies. Next up, we have Road Poetry. Lovecraft was actually way much more of a poet than a writer, like a story writer. He started reciting poetry apparently when he was two, and then he wrote his own poetry at the age of five or six. And there's so much poetry by Lovecraft. If you look at the list here, you think, oh yeah, that's, that's a couple of poems, and then you just scroll and scroll, and it just doesn't stop. There's just so much material he made, so many poems some of them are long some of them are short and he actually didn't start writing stories till he was 27 yeah that just happened so apparently lovecraft was like 
very precocious youth. One of his early favorites was Arabian Nights, but he also read like the Odyssey and mythology. He then even wrote a poem about uh, the Odyssey called The Poem of Ulysses in 1987. So that was when he was seven years old. It's insane. Or nine years? He was young. The most famous of Lovecraft poems is actually the fungi from Yugoth, which is called the Sonnet Cycle. I have it here. And it's a bunch of poems or sonnets, and it's its own story, it's its own thing. It's called Fungi from Yugoth, because you see there's Yugoth, which is a planet that um, Lovecraft actually invented or came up with. And it is kind of like Pluto, so he made it up when Pluto was found. And there is actually an area on Pluto called Cthulhu Macula. And it is shaped a bit like a whale. And there was an online poll. What to name it is, is now officially named the Belton region after astronomer Michael B J. Belton. I also found out that there is a crater called Lovecraft and Mercury. I think that is pretty cool and fun. And it shows how all these nerds, like the nerd king, his grandfather introduced him to terror. So as you all know already, Lovecraft's father died when Lovecraft was pretty young. <sighs> and so Lovecraft was brought up by the rest of his family, including his grandfather, who played an important role in his life. His name is Whipple Van Buren Phillips. And Whipple Van Buren Phillips was an industrialist and he married his own cousin. Which I think is hilarious, because in all these Lovecraft, Cthulhu cults, there are always this mishmash of immigrants and people of different races and mixes of different races and incest, everything that pure fanatics and right-wing bleeps don't like. Um, and then Lovecraft has that in his own family. And the person that was very dear to him has it in his, like, did it. So, you know, <laughs> taking a big L for HPL. And so Whipple Van Boren Phillips is the one who introduced Lovecraft to a lot of horror stories. He actually started telling him ghost stories. I don't know if he read them to him or if he was telling them to him. But Lovecraft heard a lot of ghost stories, so gothic horror, when he was a child, when he was like four or five, from his grandfather. And he also had access to his grandfather's big library. So the grandfather was very rich, and he gave Lovecraft access to the library. And that gave Lovecraft this whole literary education. And we know that Lovecraft was very sick as a child, or maybe he wasn't sick. There's the idea that maybe his mother was making him more sick than he actually was. And so he was bound to bed or bound to be home a lot. He was actually homeschooled, I think. And so he didn't have a lot to do or he was trying to find something or he was trying to find some entertainment, probably also because he was a great mind. He was looking actually for knowledge and looking for wisdom and education and so he had access to this library and he read a lot about mythology and ghost stories actually also chemistry and there's also this idea that the whole relationship between Lovecraft and his grandfather and his mother and the whole shebang is very autobiographically put into the Dunwich Horror and that the wizard Waitley character in the Dunwich Horror is actually based on his grandfather I'm going to make a video about that, I have to. It's way too cool and fun and shows, together with other stories like The Thing on the Doorstep, that so much of what Lovecraft was writing, all this cosmic horror was actually just his own life and his own experience and the way he just processed all these horrible things happening around him. I think that that's pretty much what's happening here and he was just very creative into putting it out there. I also think that Lovecraft wasn't just introduced to literary or storytelling horror by his grandfather. I think that there's this second layer to this whole thing. And that is that when the grandfather died, it was 
A Descent into Horror for Lovecraft. So before the death of his grandfather, although his own father had already died and that wasn't really nice and he was sick a lot and his mom was weird to him or very abusive to him. He was homeschooled, he didn't have a lot of friends. Lovecraft was still kind of okay because he was in a good financial situation. He was from a family that has almost like an aristocratic line. And so his grandfather provided him with status, with safety, safety in the means of money, in the means of physical safety, in the mean like the whole thing. And then when the grandfather died, he died when Lovecraft was in the beginning of his teenage years. So Lovecraft's grandfather, Whipple, he died when Lovecraft was 14, 13, 14. And he died from a fit of paralysis. He died very sudden. And Lovecraft suddenly lost all of that. He also lost the whole part of education, you know, the access to the library. Why? Because although the grandfather was very rich, the whole thing was very mismanaged. So all this money that he had put back was actually not being put back. It was being lost. It was being taken away from by other people. The, all the money was gone and Lovecraft had to make ends meet with his mom together, just the two of them. The, again, there was some family, but it wasn't nearly as financially and emotionally strong as his father and his grandfather, except for his mom. But the mom was a woman back then who didn't have a job, so Lovecraft had to make ends meet somehow. And so Lovecraft is suddenly being put into very bad housing with all these different people around him that are definitely not aristocratic, all these immigrants around him, all these people, uh, all these things that he just does not understand. And I think that these different people, you know, the non-white people, the non Anglo-Saxon people, the, the the culture, the different culture, all of this reminds him and hurts him because it reminds him of this fall, of the death of his grandfather and of the loss of this whole safety net and the whole family, basically. Like, you have one guiding person, which is your father, and you al he already didn't have that, and then he lost another one, which was his grandfather, and then there's his mom, who's absolutely abusive and weird, so his grandfather kind of abandoned him in a bad place. And so that's why I think Lovecraft was also introduced on a different level to horror by his grandfather, not only the storytelling part. Inspiration for Stephen King. So I don't think I really need to introduce Stephen King. We're going to do it anyway. He's fortunately still alive. He's one of the greatest horror writers of our generation or of our current times. Um, he wrote Carrie. He wrote The Green Mile. He wrote... The Shining, Firestarter, um, Pet Cemetery, It. So so many m books that would later turn into movies and audio dramas. The whole thing were written by Stephen King. And he always confirms that Lovecraft is very important to him. So he, in many of his stories, there's Lovecraftian elements where there's this cosmic horror, this weird godlike supernatural being that comes and brings horror and he got that from H.P. Lovecraft I just watched The Mist from 2007 this weekend I really liked it um, and it's basically that and it's pe people being terrorized by something that is very much cosmic horror it is very much written for the movies I don't know how the b what the book is like because of course you just have two hours and you have to make the whole thing work in two hours so it's very focused on horror and creature feature, which I like, but it's not anywhere what Mountains of Madness do or the Dunwich Horror or the other ones. Yes. And Stephen King has very much confirmed that Lovecraft is important for him. Lovecraft might be a great influence for him because Stephen King grew up in New England where Lovecraft and his stories are set up a lot. And so he has a very basal and emotional connection to Lovecraft stories because they're not just cool horror stories but they are set where he himself grew up and Stephen King even wrote now that time has given us some perspective on his work I think it is beyond doubt that H.P. Lovecraft has yet to be surpassed as the 20th century's greatest practitioner of the classic horror tale Lovecraft opened the way for me as he had done for others before me 
It is his shadow so long and gaunt, and his eyes so dark and puritanical, which overlie almost all of the important horror fiction that has come since. Yeah, I just watched the documentary. I rewatched it, actually. I watched it once a couple of years before. During or a bit before Corona. Um, and you can s you have interviews with, for example, um, Guillermo del Toro or Neil Gaiman, who talk about their relationship to Lovecraft and how much he influenced them. So Stephen King is just one small example, or one big example, he's important, but he's just one example on this whole list of very important artists, we're going to go to someone later, who influenced them. So for example, there's similarities between the thing of It and some of Lovecraft horrors like Cthulhu. There's this antagonist called Randall Flagg who's related to Neurolithotep. You know, like, you can see how some of the things in Stephen King's books resemble something that comes from a Lovecraftian uh, piece of literature. And of course, you know, here at the White Clown Factory, you always have to go one step deeper. And I think that he not just inspired Stephen King in a way like, oh, this is the techniques I'm using, and oh, this is what the monsters look like, and then Stephen King read it and was like oh yeah that's how you can write that's how cool monsters look and that's how you write cool things i think it's like the same with other artists where the inspiration surpasses that kind of level where you just copy something it's when you experience someone's art and you see themselves and you see the artist giving themselves permission to go that deep and to express that level and, and to express on that level of pure and personal and to just go there because what Lovecraft did is he went to places other other people haven't been and so he probably also inspired Stephen King to go to his to Stephen King's own places of horror and to his own levels where nobody else has ever been and and so he inspired Stephen King to go to other places where nobody has ever been to be that pure and raw in the expression. So, and so if you look, for example, to music, all the rock bands and metal bands from my youth have on their list of inspiration bands like Black Sabbath, Led Zeppelin, Kiss, you know, the, these old rock bands. And you listen to their music and you think, well, you got these guitars that are of course distorted and yeah okay it's a bit similar you know song structure it's a bit similar but it's way more than that it's because back then these bands did this raw and brutal and loud music that is very expressive and that shows a very different side to culture and to humanity and to how a state of being that other people back then hadn't really done a lot or uh, not that loud you know not that brutal um rock music was actually taken from black people but uh and then they said oh okay i can do that with my own stuff and then they went like okay how can i be raw it's all this about this permission thing it's all about this allowing yourself to go to a place i think that is a lot of this inspiration thing that it's you know inspiration is like the ghost of somebody else goes into you i think that's kind of what it means the soul of somebody else goes into you let me look that up before I talk shit. Inspiration. Inspiration etymology. Yeah, it is. It's like breathing the soul from... Yeah, it's just breathing soul into something. Yes. I was right. Ha! Um, yeah, so... It's also just to give this push. So my music, is, I'm a metal musician. I have a metal band. And I write scenarios for Call of Cthulhu role-playing. And I consume a lot of music that is actually not metal music. It's very soft. It's very intimate. And I take that to into my metal space because it shows me, oh, Sia is so gorgeously delicate with the ugly things inside of her, like Chandelier, for example, which is just like, oh, I'm an alcoholic or I was an alcoholic. There you go. Um and because it's very important and personal to her to show that, it's I can take it to my own song, which is about something completely different. Um, but I use this honesty and this 
I use this honesty and I give myself permission to show also sides of me that are more delicate. It's basically somebody else giving you the safety and or the courage to do your own art. I think that's what inspiration is like and that is what is the difference between inspiration and just copying something. Yeah, I just talked way more about inspiration than about Stephen King. Sorry. Yeah, that's a Stephen King chapter. <laughs> White Clown Industries. Okay, let's talk about Metallica. Woo! Uh, Metallica is an American metal band. I think it's the biggest metal band ever, or one of the biggest ones. Certainly one of the biggest ones still around. And I think the easiest connection you can see here is that they have a song called Call of Cthulhu. They spell it a bit different, Cthulhu, because apparently they thought it would be easier to pronounce. They were inspired to do this because actually Cliff Burton, the bassist from 1982 to 1986, and James Hetfield, the vocalist and guitarist, bonded over their love for Call of Cthulhu for the role-playing game, which I play with my drummer and guitarist. See what's happening here. Cliff Burton has been described as an H.P. Lovecraft reading piano player who loved beer, Mexican food, pot and acid. I don't drink, but other than that, I love me some Mexican food and I cannot play the piano. And I can't play the bass. The rest is kind of true. No, I don't smoke pot. I can't, it doesn't, it just doesn't work with my... Yeah, I don't smoke pot. And so they wrote this Call of Cthulhu song, and it was of course inspired by Call of Cthulhu, but also by Shadow of Innsmouth, apparently. And it's just a nine minute, I think nine minute, instrumental rock metal song. It's pretty cool. But that's not the only Lovecraftian or Lovecraft inspired song by Metallica. So for example, you have the song, The Thing That Should Not Be. It seems to describe something between a Shoggoth and a Cthulhu, or like both of those things are described. So it's a bit Mountains of Madnessy. There's a great old one who watches lurking beneath the sea. Timeless sleep has been upset. And then there's the song All Nightmare Long, where Hetfield actually said in an interview, it was an attempt to get back to the H.P. Lovecraft mythos with Thing That Should Not Be, Call of Cthulhu. This was about the Hounds of Tindalos, which was about these wolves that hunt through nightmares. And the only way that you can get away from them is stay within angles that are 120 degrees or less. You can't even escape through sleep. And lyrics point towards the view of the hounds. Cause we hunt you down with mercy, hunt you down all nightmare long, feel us breathe upon your face, feel us shift every move we trace. And then there's one more Metallica song that's actually quite more recent. It's called Dream No More from the Hardwired album. And again, it's more about Cthulhu. He sleeps under black seas waiting, lies dreaming in death. He sleeps under cosmos shaking, stars granting his breath. And the video is also about this spore-like Tunguska meteor. It's just very Lovecraftian or cosmic horror-y bit B-movie, the video for this song. So as you can see, just one band, Metallica, which is a big band, had a lot of Lovecraft inspiration. But way more people know Metallica than Lovecraft. I am gonna make I'm gonna make a video about Lovecraft inspired music. There's so much of it. Uh, I'm gonna make a playlist and then I'm gonna put it somewhere in one of the videos and I'm gonna tell you that it is there and you're gonna listen to it. Yes. There's also let's just no. Okay. There's one thing. There's Lovecraftian Christmas carols. And there's hours of them. The Christmas carols with Lovecraftian lyrics and themes. And apparently people on the internet say this. And I know actually some of my friends who've done this now as well. And I've done it also too. Is that when you have Christmas celebrations with family and friends. You put it in the background. And nobody listens to the lyrics and realizes that they're singing about Shoggoths and Cthulhu's. Because it sounds so much just like a Christmas carol. It's amazing. Shumagorath. I hope I pronounced it correctly. Shumagorath is a god or a creature or a being. It's a very mighty thing that has been created by Robert E. Howard and then 
Marvel came in. That's super weird. I I'm not a fan or I'm not a hater of Marvel. I just I don't I don't really there's not many connection points between me and Marvel except for maybe some of the superhero movies. Robert E. Howard came up with it in The Curse of the Golden Skull. Before all was, I was. Before time was, I waited. I fed on the screaming souls of the universes. I drank the spoiled milk of dead stars. I am the emptiness outside all understanding. I am Shuma Goroth. It was first mentioned in The Curse of the Golden Skull, in which the iron-bound books of Shuma Goroth are just briefly mentioned. It's one of the great old ones, kind of. And it's just a tentacular monster with a with an eye. That's at least what we see when we see Shuma Goroth. And it's one of the Doctor Strange's adversaries. So it's again, it's a tentacular thing that's looking weird. And I think that it's also similar to Shubnigoroth, which is one of my favorite horror monsters from Lovecraft. One of the gods that, yeah. I think like Shumagoroth and Shubnigoroth is very close. So maybe these two friends had us had an idea together and they are besties and so they made horrible monsters and gave them cute names that sound like. I think that's what happened there. You can even play Shumagoroth in one of the fighting games, I think. Abdul Al Hazret. We talked about all of this when we talked about the Necronomicon. It's a name that Lovecraft came up with when he was a child and started writing poetry as a name for himself. And then he created this character Abdul al Hazrat, this mad Arab who wrote the Necronomicon. That's all. Up to the next one. Okay, so next up is Weird Tales. Weird Tales is a bit of a cool one. Most of them are a bit of a cool one, so otherwise I wouldn't be doing this. Weird Tales is a magazine that was founded last century, like more than 100 years ago. And it is culturally very significant. And it is a small magazine that has been on and off over the years, over these 100 years. It's been founded in 1923, initially by Edwin Baird. And it is known for publishing stories from Lovecraft, um, Robert E. Howard, Robert Block, Clark Ashton Smith. So all these writers from the Lovecraft cycle who um, took part in the Cthulhu mythos. And it's been one of the most culturally significant magazines when it comes to fiction it's been called uh, second only to unknown in significance and influence or the most important and influential of all fantasy magazines so these writers that i talked about became widely known at least in the nerd fan base through these magazines which is very important and also so their stories would also not have even been published or even written without the existence of weird tales weird tales is kind of the the soil that allowed these plants to grow. Oh boy, that's that's yikes! That was a cringe one. But it's it's been kind of the thing that nurtured and made the whole scene appearing and growing available, uh, possible. I mean, it has been said that Weird Tales has functioned as a nexus point in the development of speculative fiction, from which emerged the modern genre of fantasy and horror. So let's start at the beginning. It is a pulp magazine. What are pulp magazine? You probably know the word pulp fiction from the movie Pulp Fiction. Something's happening outside of the door. There's trouble with the girlfriend and the cat because the cat is hungry. But the cat is always hungry. But now it's time and we feed the cat. And it's very loud and noisy and wants all the food. Okay. So what is a pulp magazine? You know the term pulp fiction um, from the movie Pulp Fiction. And it's basically... It's called pulp because it's been printed on paper that is made from wooden pulp. So it's a very cheap paper. And so you would print things in these pulp magazines. Fiction that was very cheap, that was very that was seen as very low, that it was seen as not classy or or having any worth when it comes to the art that's in them. That they're there for pure entertainment and very low entertainment. So when you have the movie Pulp Fiction, the story is basically just three gangster stories that are intertwined of course Pulp Fiction is an amazing movie but the essence of Pulp Fiction is that oh it's just some lowlifes doing lowlife stuff and who cares and it's just crime and sex and that was seen back then as something that you shouldn't talk about or you shouldn't write about and if you do then it's very low art and it's just for entertainment and nowadays we know that it's everything we do and everything we are 
And so if you go actually further back at the end of the 19th century, magazines would not include fiction or would always include fiction and non-fiction. And then these pulp magazines were coming with the wave of magazines that would actually just have fiction in them. And then they were spread in the variety of fiction they would do. And then Weird Tales was one of the first ones and one of the continuous ones to just focus on horror and fantasy and dark tales. And you probably wouldn't have the things going on on Netflix and the cinemas in the bookshops when it comes to horror without Weird Tales. If Weird Tales wouldn't have picked up Lovecraft and Robert E. Howard and all of those people, then you wouldn't have the things that Stephen King wrote. You wouldn't have... I think I think I gave a lot of examples of how Lovecraft and the whole cosmic horror is intertwined with current pop culture, and you would have none of that without Weird Tales. Because Weird Tales allowed that to happen and cared for those people. Many of those writers wouldn't have been encouraged to write or wouldn't have money because they, they those magazines or Weird Tales was the only magazine who would pay them for it. And now we come to something that's really cool that I almost wanted to make a whole only video about it, but I think it makes more sense to do it in the iceberg, which is Guillermo del Toro's At the Mountains of Madness. So if I would get a dollar every time a Lovecraftian god is described with an incomprehensible flash of mass and tentacles, then I would have enough money to found del Toro's Mountains of Madness. Del Toro is a Mexican director, he's one of my favorite directors, and he's been very important for the fantasy and horror genre. He made the Hellboy movies, he made Pan's Labyrinth, he won Oscars for his movies, for example Shape of Water, and I have many books about his movies and his work, like this one for example. He's currently on Netflix with his Cabinet of Curiosities. This book is called Guillermo del Toro's Cabinet of Curiosities, and this book is... 10 or 15 years or even more older than the series. So the series is kind of a play on this book. And in this book, there's even a section about the Mountains of Madness. Okay, so Del Toro is very important for me as an artist and as a emotional human being. I watched Shape of Water in the cinema and I cried ugly. I just... I. All, all of the tears and all of the almost as bad as when I watched Homeward Bound which I watched last year two years? two years ago and I cried so much and Del Toro always says that as a child he was he saw these monsters and these creatures and he was afraid of them and then I think he struck kind of a deal with the monsters and he's trying to show now the humane side of the monster or the emotional side of the monster he's taking care of the monsters like for example with The Shape of Water when he was a child, he watched Creature of the Black Lagoon. And in this movie, there's a creature in a black lagoon. And the creature tries to kidnap and murder people. And I think that it tries to kidnap a woman. So much fuss on the microphone. And then he thought, hey, what happens actually if the monster is the good one in the love story? What if it's more of a beauty and a beast, but, you know, with an actual monster, with a modern movie monster? And, you know, he gave the monster a voice. And so in Shape of Water, it's you always root for the monster. And the monster is this. Yeah, it it's really cool. Watch it. Just watch it. it. It won an Oscar. And this is one of the movies that deserved it. Go watch it. I would wake up in the dreams as if it was in my room. And I would literally see creatures. There was no difference between that and reality. In my grandmother's house, every now and then, the church bells nearby would chime late. Either at midnight or 10 p.m. I would hear the bells going ding dong, ding dong, and there was a big armoire in my room, and out would come a hand and the face of a goat and the leg of a goat. It was horrible, so horrible. So like most artists, he's gifted or cursed with a very big fantasy and this openness to what if, and then it eats you. When I watch a horror movie, the horrible part isn't just the horror movie. It's the afterwards I'm alone in my bed and all the things come to mind that could happen and that could happen next to me. When I watched The Witch from... Ah, 
when I watched The Witch, the one that came out a couple of years ago, I couldn't sleep for two days. It was at the end of my 20s and I could not sleep for two nights. I was lying in bed and I was just shaking, was just twisting my head so much. It was ugly. It was really ugly. And if you if you don't have any fantasy in your head, if you don't have any creativity, you you just watch the movie you're like, oh, that's monsters, and then who cares? And so Guillermo del Toro, he planned on doing this movie for many years. It sort of became one of his big projects that he had a Bible on, you know, that he had so much preparation and so much planning. And there's actually a CGI test from back then by LucasArts, I think. We're going to watch it now. can see how super gross that is and how cool it is and how it shows a new idea to the whole movie but you can also see how far ahead they were already in the production process so what happened the thing is the movie had a big budget 150 millions at least and they had on board tom cruise who was at the height of his career back then and they had lucas for the special effects many big people were involved it was a big project and what happened? Why did why did it not work out? Um, the problem was that at the time, Prometheus was already coming out, which was a big R-rated, I think it was R-rated, science fiction horror movie, or it was in production back then, um, with a very similar idea. So Prometheus is from the Alien series. The Alien series is inspired by the Mountains of Madness. And so you can see how two big budget movies by two different studios coming out at the same time would crash. And especially when they're so similar, when they have this whole creation myth webbed into the story. And so that was one issue. The other issue was that it was going to be R-rated. Del Toro said if he does it, he's going to do it the right way and it's going to be a dark, brutal movie. You can't do PG-13 on that. Especially back then. Back then, blockbusters with that budget were never R-rated. You had like Deadpool and three others. But it wasn't something that usually would happen. Um, there were like 300 pieces of you know concept art and prep different pieces of preparations that were made for the movie. And like in the last second, they broke off the whole idea and then Del Toro continued with other projects and he still wants to do it. In fact, there's been some tweets and rumors that in the course of his collaboration with Netflix, maybe he's going to do a shorter version of the movie, which would still be cool. And then a couple of years ago, like I think two years ago, the script actually was published online. I don't think it was published or it was leaked, but a lot of people analyzed it. Um, and what's happening is that the script is actually very far away from the Mountains of Madness. It kind of meets half or even further into the direction of the Mountains of Madness and uh, the thing. I really like The Thing. I think The Thing is one of the best cosmic horror movies out there from from the old generation, let's say. From the new one, I would say the good ones are like Annihilation and The Void. I'm going to make a list. So the whole story is different. So I think if I would have seen it now, um, I would not have really liked it. I think going into the cinema and having read the story so many times and then getting something completely different would kind of have maybe disappointed me. I'm, I'm just going to be honest. I, I think it would have disappointed me because it loses a bit on the cosmic horror side and is more about action and the whole... Uh, the thing. Thing. The whole... Is it a man? Is it an alien? Who's who? So I think I wouldn't have liked it as much as I would want if it to like it. If I would have if there would be a a movie coming out and it is a cosmic horror movie and it, it would not be called The Mountains of Madness, then I would not have been disappointed. It's just this whole expectation of, oh, they're gonna make Mountains of Madness. And I don't think Mountains of Madness is that much of a good idea for a movie actually. Not for at least a big blockbuster movie, because it's it's kinda slow. And also something I forgot to mention is that 
the the dark and black ending of the movie was back then a it's not well, it wasn't a taboo but again it was something where people would think oh it's gonna make l less money because the ending is really not nice you know you gotta have a happy ending and you gotta have two blonde ladies and the rest is dudes and the dudes talk about dude stuff and the ladies also talk about dude stuff and that's how you win in the movie industry and had a happy ending hell yeah and nowadays i think the movie would have been able to be made especially with the whole cosmic horror that's been going on recently and also the distance to prometheus i think it would it would have chances today also, by researching this, I found something that is really cool, which is the term big dumb object. In discussion of a science fiction, a big dumb object is any mysterious object, usually of extraterrestrial or unknown origin and immense power, in a story which generates an intense sense of wonder by its mere existence. To a certain extent, the term deliberately deflates the intended grandeur of the mysterious object. And I think that's really cool. It's kind of like a science fiction MacGuffin. It's this object that is just too big to understand. So if, for example, in Prometheus, you have this whole spaceship that they find from the architects. That, I think, is a BDO, a big dumb object. Um, I think that's just a cool term. So in, in Mountains of Madness, it would be the whole city, the whole mountain city thing with all of the alien architecture in there. What you can take away from this whole part of the video is Mountains of Madness, cool story. Del Toro, amazing director. The Thing, an amazing film. Watch The Thing, read The Mountains of Madness, watch Del Toro's movies. Let's go for it. Del Toro's Cabinet of Curiosities on Netflix, I can very much recommend. The Viewing and The Autopsy. Those two episodes are amazing. They did really, I watched both of them multiple times. They're Go for it. Do it. Now we come to the big one. The Cthulhu Mythos. I think that's one that you gotta know when you wanna learn about Lovecraft. The Cthulhu Mythos is a word and it describes um, this whole narrative that Lovecraft and Cosmic Horror tried to express it's this whole incomprehensible horror things that are so strange and alien that you can understand them so lovecraft had a friend and again pan pal called august derleth and he came up with the cthulhu mythos and again it uses the word cthulhu as the face of cosmic horror as the face of lovecraft probably also because it's a bit more easily pronounceable than the other ones and again it's at least you have a squid head, you know, at least you have that thing. So that's the face of Lovecraftian and cosmic horror. What is it exactly? All my tales are based upon the fundamental premise that common human laws and interests and emotions have no validity or significance in the vast cosmos at large. Lovecraft said that. And there's kind of this idea that you either have sanity and you know, good mental health and a capacity to function or you understand the truth of reality and the cosmos. And if you do both, you can't do both. The more you do of one, the other one gets lost. There's a cool mechanic in Call of Cthulhu, the role-playing game, where players have a skill called Cthulhu Mythos, which shows how much they understand of all these weird things going on. And they can, you know, make a skill check when they see something that's weird and alien and then maybe they just know what it is. Maybe they understand what's going on. And then they have a second health meter to their physical health, which is sanity. And for yeah, sanity goes up to 100 and Cthulhu Mythos goes up to 100. But for each point you gain in Cthulhu Mythos, you lose one maximum point of sanity. So... In the end, when you understand everything and you have 100 Cthulhu Mythos, you go you you go automatically to zero sanity and your character becomes unusable. So the, it's it's cool this ludo narrative. Is it that? No, I don't think that it's a, the term is applicable here. Let's nerd out on that another time. But I I think that that's a really cool way of 
showing the f of putting this philosophy into the game that the more you understand what's going on the the more you're losing your marbles and it's this idea that the truly alien things the true cosmic truths and all of these things can never be understood per se like it it's not that you could really know what's going on it's so alien that it's out of our grasp to understand it you as a human being you cannot understand what's going on here which is a kid kind of contradictory to what i said before but again that's like if you sacrifice your brain to the whole thing then maybe you get an idea of what's going on it's a hard one to describe i'm sorry and then what the cthulhu mythos is also really known for is just this pandemonium or this pantheon of gods and creatures and they're layered into different groups, um, which is, you know, you can't understand them, but we also know that it's just literature. And so we can actually put them into groups. And there's been different ways to put them into groups. There's the outer ones, there's the old ones, there's um, avatars. There's different groups. And some of them are mentioned in Lovecraft's writing and in other people's writing. And then August Derleth. So August Derleth was the first one to categorize them, and he had this idea of putting the gods into, or the, the big creep, or the powerful Lovecraftian beings into four, and then later five categories that are each represented by an element. I'm not really happy about that way to categorize it. I think it's a bit boring. I think it's trying to force a categorization onto it that was never present before i mean you get, get it that cthulhu and dagon and the watery gods represent water and then the fiery gods represent fire but that isn't that is yeah just doesn't do it for me but there's a second really cool way to categorize them because we do like to put things into excel sheets or brainy excel sheets as humans and that is chaosium which is the creator of Call of Cthulhu, which I, the role-playing game, which I'm a big fan of, again. They have this book called Maleus Monstrorum, which is a two-pager. I have it. I only have the digital version now because the book is still being shipped here. I'll show it probably in the next video. And it's just one book is all the monsters, like all the creatures, and the other one is all the gods and deities. So they split it up into two things. And then the gods they categorized in the book. The reason why I respect Chaosium so much is because they always let the artist speak first. They never add on anything useless or they never force themselves onto something that's already there. They never, they always let, let the artists have the art and then they only add things that are important for gameplay, which of course makes sense because you want to play a game. And so, of course, the gods need to have rules need, there needs to be a system how they work because otherwise they can't fit in a game where you roll dice and where if a character sheet and everything but other than that they always try to draw from the source material and they only add on to things that make sense they do not try to force gods into categories by elements august derleth probably august derleth works at chaosium or worked at chaosium and now i'm an idiot as per usual, but I just I just thought that that was a really goofy idea to categorize them in this way, and I like the way that Chaosium does it. And we're gonna go through some of them, and I'm gonna show you some of the layers. Let's go. So first of all, with every god or every being, you have this entry format of you have a description, you have other names that the creature has, you have a main entry, then you have cults. Cults are really important in Call of Cthulhu and in the whole Lovecraft sphere because you very often have this human representation or these humans that are dedicated to this god. And it's always this other side of, oh, this isn't just destruction. This either entices people to follow it or it actually does something for people. It actually fulfills dark wishes and needs that people have. Which I really like because it's always related to humans. It's not always just a oh, big bad creature with many tentacles, but it's also what it does to the humans. So, for example, when you watch the ritual, then you watch the ritual and you know what I mean. Or when you watch Apostle. I'm always going for movies here because it's 
you can just do it today. You can just be like, oh, Orlando said that I have Netflix. I have Netflix or access to other websites and I can just watch that today. Oh, it's really cool. By the way, I just revealed my own name. There you go. Hi, I'm Orlando. <laughs> yeah, nice to meet you. You can say your own name in front of the screen right now and I will shake your hand or tentacle if you're gobo gag. There's very often this cult that is around a deity in Lovecraft or in cosmic horror. And I really like that. I really like that there's it's kind of trade. There's this kind there, there there's an actual relationship or that they can act like there's a relationship between them and humans. Not always, not with all of the beings, but with many of them. And that makes it so interesting to me. And then there's encounters, like where would you see this creature? Where would you encounter it? What? How does it get into our sphere? And then there's the aura, the powers, and some other gameplay stuff, because you just gotta have some... Again, it's for a game, so you gotta have some gameplay stuff. But let's not focus on that too much. Let's just go through the Pantheon, and let's go through how they're categorized. So let's start with the old ones. The old ones are actually mentioned in some of the Lovecraft tales. Um, most famous one is Cthulhu. There's also Cthulhu, Katanathoa, Hastur, Itaqua, Rantagoth, Tsathogua, many more. And the greater and lesser old ones, they're all very powerful alien beings in the Cthulhu mythos. And they have supernatural abilities, but they operate independently in isolation and they have always this element of the stars have to be right for them to do their thing. So they are the ones that have a lot of contact with human beings and th they kind of seem like a very unique big creature that is somewhere between a god and just a big fella. <laughs> no! So great old ones are something that if a human sees it, they would think, yep, that's a god, that I am meeting god right now, or one god. But in terms of the whole Cthulhu mythos, they are something that is not that big. And they're waiting for the stars to align to have their true potential going on. And they are a lot in communication with humans or afflicting humans. But they could also just be a big fella, a big creature, something that is just, you know, just it's like a bear versus one ant. And the ant is a human, you know, it's just that size difference. Now let's go on with the outer gods. The outer gods are actual true gods, whatever that means. They have way more effect on reality. So they are very far out in space or in dimensions. They're very far away from us. That's why they're called the outer gods. And they do not have any really close relationship with humans. They have only, or a lot, they have this relationship with humans because just because we exist in their space or in their reality. Some really cool examples of old ones are Azathoth, Shubnigoroth, which is one of my favorite Cthulhu beings, creatures, monsters, gods, um, Yoxothoth, and Neurolathotep. Azathoth is the center of the universe and also the creator and simultaneously destroyer of the universe. And then Yogg-Sothoth controls time and dimensional gateways, but he's outside of our reality. So I think you can see how they're way harder to grasp than just Big Squid Boy. And then there's the idea that Neuralathotep is like the consciousness of the outer gods or, you know, the representation of the outer gods, you know, like the face. Or that he's the communicator between the outer gods and, for example, humans, or just our reality. So he's more of, you know, this vessel, or this f face of all the ones behind it. So Neurolathotep is the one that's more grasp graspable, more gr more to grasp. Neurolathotep is the one that's easier to grasp than the other ones. And there's this idea of Azathoth floating in space, and there's these outer gods that dance around it, and some of them play instruments to keep it as to, to have it sleep because if Azathoth awakes then everything is destroyed and sometimes some of them get ejected into space and then they turn into larvae who then later on become their own outer gods i hope i got that right this is all so confusing although i read about it so much but it's i hope i got it right and then you have elder gods which are somewhere between old ones and outer gods 
they are gods, elder gods are gods by name. So for example, you have Bast or Hypnos. I think there's a Pokemon called Hypnos. We don't talk about this one. We talk about an elder god. And they probably oppose the older gods, so they're more gods, more weird big creatures. Um, but they can be afflicted by humans, so they're again somewhere between in the in the in sense of scale, they're somewhere between um, outer gods and old ones. Jesus, I'm getting confused. So these beings have an agenda, and they can be warded off by humans, or at least they can be afflicted by humans, and they play their game with humans, and they also try to hold down the outer gods and then there's avatars so avatars are representations or like near lathotep with the outer gods avatars an avatar is what it is an avatar is the representation of an of a god or a representation of a being so for example you have the black pharaoh for near lathotep you have the king in yellow for Hustur. You have the Lady of the Woods for Ship Nigoroth, and you have Leviathan for Cthulhu. So these are basically like a little figure that represents the god and that acts in the god's favor or that the god cloaks into and talks to humans, for example. Because if you if there's a ring on the door and you open the door and there's Haster, you fucking die. But if the doorbell rings and it's the king in yellow and he talks to you, you're like, ah, oh, you're the postman. That's why you're yellow, huh? I just came up with that. I'm so br so proud of myself. Basically, an avatar in any other sense is that, for example, when you play a game, when you play a computer game, then actually the little figurine. So, for example, when you play... So, for example, every player character is an avatar. When you play World of Warcraft, your little man that's on the screen, that's kind of your avatar. He represents you, you... It, he or she represents you and you control them and but still there's something way bigger and more powerful behind your orc hunter than uh than you would than you would see on the screen you would you have this in actual religion where you know zeus turns into a swan and then he bangs somebody the swan isn't actually zeus it's just the swan i think also, a theory about World of Warcraft that I have is that Horde people are the cool people. I always chose Horde. And the fun thing is that, that I played that a long time ago. And now I, I, I started with Classic. I started day one or two. And the funny thing is that when I get to know people now and we find out that we both played World of Warcraft back then, 95% it's Horde. And that's just fun because I think that when you play a fantasy game and you play a white human then there's a good chance you're not my friend and there's a good reason why you... Because <laughs> why? Why would you do that? You're so boring. <laughs> I really think that. I'm, I'm not trying to diss you if you're an Alliance player. I just think that it's fun how people who I think are interesting to me turn out to play Horde and not Alliance. You think that more Trump voters play Alliance? Wouldn't surprise me. And then the last group, sorry for the tangent, is unique beings. Unique beings is something that is somewhere between all of those categories, and it's just a big boy, a big fella, a big creature. It's just very unique. You can't really describe it, but it's powerful, and it's there, and it's got a name, and it's important. So, for example, Dagon and Hydra, This these two semi-gods from the fish people from the deep ones or Ypsil, I hope I got that one right yeah um, but those are just the gods and they were trying to categorize them but then you think about it and then the Cthulhu mythos has all these creatures you know night gods, deep ones shoggoths all of that is part of the Cthulhu mythos and also places like Yugoth or the plateau of Leng and some of these stories contradict each other and some of them riff off of each other and some a lot a lot of time you you read something and it doesn't make sense and the th reason why it doesn't make sense is because your human mind can't comprehend it 
and the real art is in writing a story that doesn't make sense and you want to find out what's going on and you read about it. And I think that's one of the big hidden achievements of cosmic horror that cosmic horror puts in your face hey what you're gonna see nah, doesn't really make sense you're gonna think a lot why and you're not gonna get an answer and you're gonna like it i think that is pretty cool i think that that is something that in every other genre or in most other genres it's either included in the genre that 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 things just don't make sense and it's hilarious or it sucks if it's in any other genre you know if you watch an action movie and everything's really cool and dangerous and then suddenly they have a big safe behind their car on the chain and your reality just flew out the window and you sit there you're like what no it's stupid um or if everything is just Deus Ex Machina, or you, you just you you know you know when you watch a movie or when you read a story and suddenly things don't make sense anymore, you usually lose interest in the story. But with cosmic horror, you really get you, you that that's why you read it. And I think it's because this one takes the issue right on. It's not oh I'm gonna try to tell a story and I'm just gonna ignore some of the parts that don't make sense because I want to tell a cool story. This one is I'm gonna tell a story. And one of the import most important part about the story is that some of the parts not gonna make sense. That's that's it. That's that's the Cthulhu mythos. It's this whole thing, and you will start reading cosmic horror and watching movies and talking to people who are into it, and then you will get more and more an idea of what it actually is and what's part of it. Thank you everybody for watching again. I hope that this made sense and I hope that you had fun. It was my intent with the Cthulhu Mythos to help you orient in the Lovecraftian deity part of the Lovecraft universe. Um, and also I hope that I managed to show how so much of current pop culture is influenced by this small writer that is often forgotten he's called the titan of terror but everybody's like oh he's a racist what did he do he wrote like five stories i don't care but I, that's what i want to show how much is intertwined with what's happening in pop culture even today yeah so i'm so glad that everybody watched it thank you so much i will be back with more i love you all have a good night Bye bye